So welcome, John, to our to our virtual OEA network. We're really happy to have you today. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to give a quick introduction, and then Yanir will start start us off with some questions. All right, thank you, Katie. You're so, as you know, uh, we have a very special guest, uh, John Barry. Um, the National Academies of Science named his 2000 book, uh, The Great Influenza, the year's best book on science or medicine, and it was a number one New York Times bestseller. He was the only non-scientist on a federal government infectious disease board of experts, served on the original team which recommended public health measures to mitigate a pandemic, advised the White House and the Bush and Obama administrations on pandemic preparedness and response and is the only non-scientist ever to give the National Academies of Science Able Woman Distinguished Lecture. John's articles have appeared in such scientific journals as Nature and Journal of Infectious Disease, and such lay publications as New York Times, Esquire, Time, and The Washington Post. And he has, had, has been on the guest uh, broadcast network in the United States, um, appearing on such shows as NBC's Meet the Press, PBS, The News Hour, and NPR's All Things Considered. He has served on numerous boards, including at MIT, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and is a distinguished scholar at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And with that, Mr. John Barry. Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> so if we, if we follow the question and answer sec, sec, uh, format, um, I think it would be very good to you know, not assume that people know about the 1918 pandemic and really what happened at the time, what was the disease, what was the basic um, uh, thing, that, what, what went on. Could you set the stage for us? Sure, sure. Uh, first, there, I mean, there are a lot of similarities and parallels and, and some significant dissimilarities with what's going on today. Uh, similarities. For one thing, obviously, it was a new virus that jumped species and entered the human population. There was essentially no immunity to it. Um, I mean, there was some some bit of cross protection uh, from prior influenza viruses, which I think accounted for the fact that in the Western world, the case fatality rate was much less than in the less developed world, which had never seen an influenza virus. Uh, but basically a naive population. Uh, the, also a respiratory virus, of course, so the uh, mode of transmission was identical uh, to COVID. Uh, airborne, droplets, perhaps some fomites, but you know, I think there might be a little bit more fomite transmission in influenza than, than with uh, COVID, but, but not much with either. Uh, the the virus in 1918 was capable of inf affecting every organ in the body, quite literally from the testes to the brain. Uh, the, the differences were noticed on autopsy on essentially every organ, in, in, including the brain. Uh, there was, a, you know, neurological complications uh, in, in 1918 were, if anything, greater than they are right now. Um, it came in waves. There were variants. Uh, the first wave in 1918 was really quite mild. It was so mild you could see medical journal, read medical journal articles. I think it was BMJ, if I remember rightly, um, that actually said this looks and smells like influenza, but it's not killing enough people, so it can't be influenza. Uh, that was the first wave. Uh, uh, probably the best contemporary study after the pandemic, published in 1927, uh, noted that the first wave was not particularly transmissible. It said, quote, had a tendency to peter out, uh, unquote, uh, quote, lacked the penetrating power of the second wave, unquote. So you had a variant emerge in the summer of 19, that first wave occurred, uh, probably started, the first no, noticed uh, cases were probably in late February. Uh, and then in March, it, it spread and went through Europe. It's, 
fact, it's called the Spanish influence. We don't really know where it started, but we do know it didn't start in Spain. It picked up the name Spanish influence because Spain was not at war and was writing about it freely. And the countries at war were uh, largely muted. They didn't want to say anything that might affect morale. Uh, so you had this mild first wave, not particularly transmissible. Uh, the second wave was highly transmissible, went everywhere, and uh, was quite lethal. The death toll is an estimated 50 to 100 million in a much smaller worldwide population. If you adjust for population, it would be equivalent to about 225 to 450 million people today. Uh, most of the deaths probably were from secondary bacterial pneumonias, but there clearly were uh, many, many deaths from direct involvement of the virus, cytokine storms, uh, and, and so forth. There was, interestingly, if you were sick in the first wave, you got up to 94% protection against second wave. And uh, for those of you who know what current influenza vaccines are like, that, that's extraordinary. The best influenza vaccine ever developed was 61% effective. It's usually in the 30s or 40s. So that protection was, was really unusual. Um, you then got a third wave and I, I would say over two and a half year period or so, two, three year period, probably two thirds of the deaths would be my guess, although the data is not great on this, were compressed into 14 or 15 weeks in the fall of 1918. It was a very intense period. Uh, in March of 1919, you got a third wave, which did not hit everywhere. It was significantly less lethal than the second wave, but it was clearly lethal. It was much more deadly than, than the uh, first wave. Interestingly, if you were sick in the first or second wave, you had no protection whatsoever against infection in the third wave. Um, so obviously that variant developed, which escaped immunity and certainly is parallel to today. Uh, some of the, uh, th there was then, in fact, I had an op-ed in, in Monday's uh, Times online. They actually just told me that they're going to, it'll be in the Sunday review section this weekend, in which I was talking about the fact in, that the, uh, most of the histories of the pandemic, including the CDC website, yes. speak only about three waves in the pandemic. In fact, there was a fourth wave that hit in 1920. And this way, in, in some cities in the US and probably around the world, but I don't have data from around the world, uh, but in Detroit, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Kansas City, and some other places, the fourth wave was actually deadlier than even the second wave. Uh, overall, however, it was roughly equal to the third wave. Uh, the data that I have on the fourth wave suggests that it hit people who were not previously infected. There was a door-to-door -door survey of 10,000 people in Boston uh, by some pretty good epidemiologists who found 85% of the, of the people sick had not been sick in earlier waves. Uh, there was a similar observation in Detroit, although it wasn't quantified. Uh, in 1921, however, things returned to pre-pandemic normals. You know, I think partly that was because of the immune uh, protection, which by then essentially 100% of the population had. Uh, at the same time, the virus was was mutating. Uh, the 19, the original 1918 virus could infect, like SARS-CoV-2, both the lung directly could bind to cells in the lung, which made it lethal, and it could bind to cells in the upper respiratory tract, which made it highly transmissible. You know, SARS-1, well, it's not, I don't want 
uh, get into exactly that. But clearly, the 1918 virus lost the ability to bind to cells deep in the lung. Ordinary seasonal influenza does not do that, or at least not on as a as a general rule. I imagine there must be some occasions where it happens, but it's very unusual. Uh, the 1918 virus was pretty good at binding the cells directly in the lung. But by 1921, as I said, uh, the, the numbers were just like ordinary seasonal influenza up and down each year. There was a significant uptick in 1928, which led the Congress to create the National Institutes of Health. You might think that Congress would have acted right after the pandemic, but no, they needed a reminder. Uh, and that, that virus continued to circulate until it was replaced by the 1957 pandemic virus. So, uh, and, you know, in terms of differences, I already mentioned the lethality. So, John, John let, let me ask a couple of other questions. If okay. You might, if I might. Yeah. So could you describe the, the dynamics of the disease in a person? Right, because you had, you described in your book, you know, someone gets infected, what happens next? Yeah. Well, you know, most people, of course, uh, even in 1918, got, well, at least in the West, hadn't what we are all familiar with an ordinary attack of influenza. Uh, but for those unfortunate enough where the virus did bind to the lung, uh, that was something entirely different. The cyanosis could be extreme enough that in, in the book I quoted a physician who said he couldn't distinguish African-American soldiers from white soldiers because the cyanosis was so intense. Uh, you know, some of the, that obviously spread rumors of, of the black plague and so forth. Uh, probably the most frightening symptom was uh, uh, bleeding. You know, uh, there are reports at 15% of where the military data is very good. Uh, and there's a lot of it. Uh, in, in some army camps, 15% of the uh, people sick uh, had nosebleed. Uh, there were also reports of people bleeding uh, from the ears, uh, even from their eyes and from every uh, mucosal membrane, and, and including vaginal bleeding, which was initially uh, uh, confused with uh, menstruation. Uh, the disease, the symptoms, could be pretty much anything. It was uh, initially misdiagnosed as, as cholera and typhoid and even dengue, so which was known as breakbone fever. So it gives you a sense of what those symptoms are like. Uh, it was- How long did it take? What was the course of the disease in time? Yeah, one of the big differences between influenza and COVID is duration. Everything about influenza moves faster than, than COVID. You know, the- uh, incubation period, even with Omicron, which is a lot faster than uh, than earlier uh, variants. Uh, it's still slower than, than influenza. How long you shed virus and so forth and so on. So is we, you know, we've probably all had influenza at, at some, at one point. You, you're, you're sick, you're, your first symptoms it's a sudden onset and you know when you're sick. I mean, people could report basically being hit by a truck. Uh, in the really severe cases, there are, you know, it's anecdotal, but from very, very credible observers of people dying in as little as 12 hours after the first symptom. I think uh, this is really important from, from understanding disease differences and what is the difference. So it's, you described that you would, there would be train cars or something like that. Why don't you describe that? Right, bit? where, right. There are reports from, uh, I didn't get this from a primary source, but I thought a reasonably a, a, a credible secondary source uh, where, you know, trams in, in South Africa, which was pretty hard hit, uh, you know, so, uh, someone got on, the, the trolley and he got off and, you know, half the people on the car were deceased, including the driver. Uh, you know, it, it was horrific. There are studies from another major difference, possibly the biggest difference between 
that and COVID is the demographic of, of whom was, who was sick. The most vulnerable population in 1918 was children under 10 and particularly children under five. Uh, Cotter Mesher, who's a friend of mine and was then in the White House and is one of the heroes of Michael Lewis's book, so you may know his name. Uh, Lewis wrote a pretty interesting book called Premonition, although I have some some quibbles with it. But uh, Carter did a computation and figured that the deaths of children under five equaled all cause mortality for that age bracket over a period of 26 years today. So think of the impact on a society or on a parent, on a family with that kind of death toll compressed into a period of a few weeks. Uh, the next area of the target was uh, otherwise healthy young people. There are studies of hospitalized pregnant women that ranged from 21% to 71% case mortality. Uh, there was a peak uh, at age 28 uh, of, of death. The excess mortality for people over 65 was less than 5% of the total excess mortality. So 95% of the excess mortality was people younger than 65. So obviously that's a huge difference uh, between what's going on today. Uh, you, I, I think that's good. I mean, if you want to say more, go ahead. But I wanted to go on to the government response issues. Well, I was just going to say uh, one more thing. You know, I already mentioned the duration. You know, the, the waves lasted for a much shorter time in 1918. Uh, and when they were gone, they seemed to be gone. Uh, and people didn't know that another one was coming. Uh, and so the stress, you know, it, it was much more intense than today, much more tragic than today. But the stress on the economy and the duration, what we've gone through today is actually probably greater uh, than what it was in 1918. So uh, I will I will stop my more or less presentation at that point. And so let's let's go on to the next question, which is, um, yeah. So so Carlos is actually asking a very good question. He's saying the percentage of the population that was over sixty or sixty five was probably a lot smaller than it is today. So. That might have played some role in the percentage. Well, yes and no. I mean, you're comparing it to a certain baseline. Okay. So the baseline in 19, you, you had a baseline in 1918, and you're comparing the excess mortality of that baseline. Okay. So the absolute numbers shouldn't come into it. Absolutely. So let's go on to talk about the government response. And you, you kind of laid out quite a bit in your book about what happened with the government response. Why don't you um, go ahead and, and, and describe that? Uh, sure. Uh, we were at war. And uh, I think at no time in American history, really, including the McCarthy period and the Red Scare, various Red Scares, uh, did the government put in as much effort into making the population think a certain way and all this and there was voluntary censorship uh, although there was a law that threatened um, 20 years in prison if anyone criticized the government uh, but there was voluntary censorship by virtually every newspaper in the United States and incidentally speaking about that law they actually sent a congressman to jail for 10 years or sentence went to jail it was overturned by the Supreme Court so they enforce that quite rigorously. Uh, so the government didn't want any bad news about anything. I already referred to uh, this, the name the Spanish flu, and that's why it's called the Spanish flu. Uh, but as a result, they minimized the impact of the pandemic. You had a national public health leader 
uh, saying this is ordinary influenza by another name. You had another public health national leader saying uh, you have nothing to worry about if proper precautions are taken. And this was echoed by almost every local uh, public health leader, by almost every local newspaper. I mean, for example, in, uh, in Little Rock, the, uh, you know, at a time when you have a report in an army base a few miles outside, from a, from a doctor, actually Rockefeller Institute guy, very good scientist, saying we have here nothing but death and destruction. We have thousands of soldiers sick, hundreds dying. You know, a few miles away in Little Rock, the Little Rock newspaper has a big headline, influenza, same old fever and chills. But the medium is a message and the message is daily life. When your neighbor is dying horrifically with horrific symptoms in 48 hours. When you see children dying, you know it's not ordinary influenza by another name. So the trust and authority disintegrated and it disintegrated very rapidly. Uh, what was left was essentially chaos. Right now we're in a very different situation. You almost, you have two belief systems. You have majority of the people who believe Tony Fauci, and you have a minority of people who believe, you know, in hydroxychloroquine and, you know, and so forth, and essentially nonsense. Uh, it's become part of their identity, but they're firm believers in it. In 1918, you were completely at sea. You knew what you were being told was a lie, but you had nothing that you could believe in with any any sense of certainty. It was even in that way, I think, a more unsettling situation. I think ultimately society is based on trust. And without trust, society begins to fray. Uh, i tell you how bad it got. I quoted uh, Victor Vaughn, who was a very serious guy. He had been, he was a very important figure in American medicine, a dean of the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, during the war, uh, had a communicable diseases for the army. And he said it just as it peaked that if the current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth. That's how bad it got at its peak. Um, course, obviously that didn't happen uh, because the pandemic did recede. But a lot of that, would, you have reports of people starving to death, not because there wasn't any food, but because there was so much fear that uh, no one would bring food to these families, including, you know, close relatives. Uh, you have reports of that not only in big cities, but in rural areas where you would expect family and community to be everything. If we can, why don't you pick, uh, I understand that there were some places where they did better in communicating what was going on in some places. Right. Of course. Yeah. yeah, I use San Francisco as an example. And uh, I don't know if it had anything to do with the fact that San Francisco had gone through the earthquake a decade earlier or not could be a coincidence that, that might have been a factor. But unlike other cities where the local public health leader was echoing the national leader, this is ordinary influenza by another name. In San Francisco, the mayor and other public officials, the leaders of the business community, trade union leaders, medical leaders, all put their names on a full page ad in the newspaper that ran a few times in huge print. It said, wear a mask and save your life. Now, the masks they were wearing then, I think were pretty useless. But that is a very different message than this is ordinary influenza by another name. And San Francisco seemed to function much better than most other cities. 
in terms of being able to deliver uh, care and, and, and even food uh, to the extent that there are reports that when schools were closed in almost every city, but not all of them. In fact, New York and Chicago didn't close schools, but almost every city did. Uh, when the, the teachers, when the schools closed, they volunteered as everything from uh, telephone operators to ambulance drivers, which obviously would have been a high risk uh, thing to volunteer for. But there was a greater sense of community and helping each other. And in most disasters, there is, I, I think people tend to come together. I, you know, I'm in New Orleans, I can tell you in Katrina, there, there was a real sense of community and there was plenty of heroism in Katrina. You know, not to say that there, there wasn't in 1918, there was particularly from doctors and nurses. Uh, if you look at JAMA in those days, you would see page out of, after page of death notices in the tiniest print of, of doctors who had died. Uh, but, you know, there was this fraying, as I said, and this lack of trust and this fear uh, that developed, even to the extent, and, and in fact, here, here's an example. There are rumors spread that, or another similarity between COVID and, and 1918, it infected other mammals very, you know, essentially every mammal, uh, dogs, cats, and seals. Humans gave pigs in H1N1 in 1918. Uh, but when a, there was a rumor spread in Phoenix that dogs were uh, a source of influenza, people started killing their pets. And in Katrina, people refused to be rescued unless the pets could go with them. The Coast Guard actually had to change their policy on that. Uh, and this was a life-threatening situation, but they wouldn't leave their pets. And in Phoenix, are, they're killing them. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, trust is important to keep society together. Yeah. So um, let's now go into the, you know, what can we learn? Now, one of the challenges, of course, is that 1918 influenza pandemic is, is one, ex one instance of an experience. And, you know, it's kind of hard to know how we can generalize from one case to another. Uh, but please, you know, you've been advising governments for a long time. What are the key messages that you feel are the ones to be learned? Well, I mean, there are two. The first is tell the truth. And the second is I think that NPIs work, although, the, and the two are intertwined. I know that uh, in the Bush administration, I was part of sort of conceptualizing uh, a plan. I, you know, didn't get in any detail or into the little subsequent process of when it was actually written. But uh, I, I did talk to a lot of people, and what I always brought to those meetings was telling, you know, in my words, I people talk about transparency, which is what it is. But I prefer saying bluntly, tell the truth. You know, and I don't like this whole field of risk communication because it implies managing the truth. I say you don't manage the truth, you tell the truth, although obviously you do have to figure out exactly what you want to say, not in the sense of worrying so much about well, you don't want to scare people, but you can't say everything. You have to be somewhat selective. Uh, you know, and people, if you don't tell them the truth, they're going to figure it out soon. And you're going to lose credibility. And you're not going to get any compliance. Uh, that's why I say the NPIs and and the messaging are intimately linked uh, to each other. Uh, by the same token, you know, although I'm a firm advocate of NPIs, uh, I don't want to overrate what I think they can accomplish. Uh, you know, I used to get into arguments with modelers uh, over that. You know, it, there are limits. By the same token, if you look at some country, you know, Australia comes to mind. 
uh, what they've done in the last two years. Uh, in places like Australia, NPIs have been more effective than I think the strongest advocates ever imagined they could be. So let's talk about, um, I, I think that there are, um, I, I think that you've really laid out a very powerful uh, case and really the, the opportunity for, for the public, for communities to take uh, ownership of outcomes uh, through NPIs is, is surely a key message that we would like to be carried forth. There is a, um, there are a lot of questions that have been posted in the, in the chat, but maybe we can get people to um, articulate their questions. Uh, um, uh, why don't we start uh, with... Um, yeah, Junior, I've been tracking the questions and I was ahead, planning please. on like calling on folks in order. So please do. we'll start that now. So thanks everyone for your, your questions and your enthusiasm. And thanks John for this great information so far. So Carlos, we'll start with you if you would like to start with your question. I'm gonna go down the list in the order in which people um, posted their interest and questions. So it was already answered, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. All right, we'll move on to Tracy. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Uh, yeah, so my, my question was, uh, and um, Mr. Barry, he did touch on it briefly uh, with San Francisco and that Bay Area, but my question was, um, what uh, were there any <clears throat> actions that stood out as being transformative um, in of the places that did well? Like, was there anything specifically that stood out as being transformative? I know um, John, you said the, the truth, telling the truth. And um, was there anything else specifically in terms of NPIs um, or um, strategy? Or? Well, you know, there was, I thought during the course of researching the book, trying to figure out, there's wide variety in, uh, in mortality from one city to another. And I tried to look for a pattern, and frankly, I couldn't find one. Uh, one of the confounders was the fact that New York had a relatively mild experience of you on a per capita basis, 33,000 deaths, if you want to consider that mild. But they never did anything. They did probably less than any city. Chicago also did very, very little, almost nothing. And they had a relatively mild experience. Both of them, however, had a spring wave, a pronounced spring wave, which did not get everywhere. So in the course of looking at the book, I was not convinced that NPIs were that significant. However, you know, there have been some pretty systematic uh, studies. Uh, one of them, the, the first was by uh, Carter Messer, whom I mentioned earlier, who was then in the White House and National Security Council along with his colleague, Richard Hatchett, uh, who's now runs COVAX and uh, ran BARDA for a while. Uh, and they did a systematic look at what cities did, and they concluded uh, that the NPIs did make a difference in morbidity and mortality. There was also a study uh, that was funded by DOD and run by Howard Markell at the University of Michigan and Marty Cetron at CDC, uh, which, which found the same thing. So I am perfectly happy to accept those studies. And, you know, plus obviously I mentioned Australia earlier, you know, you look at what was, has been accomplished there, 3,000 deaths equivalent to about 35,000 in the United States on a per capita basis. So clearly those things did work, uh, you know, but I can't really answer your question because they were not apparent unless you, and you know, I didn't do a national city by city analysis. I was writing a narrative. I was trying to understand the course of the disease, uh, but I didn't have the resources to look at uh, every city systematically and compare and contrast. But the, the differences were not apparent to the eye. Uh, 
you really had to run, look pretty deeply at events to figure them out. You know, I, as I said, I attributed uh, what happened in New York and Chicago to uh, Spring Wave, and I'm sure and they had to be because they didn't employ any NPIs or nothing of any consequence. So obviously, spring exposure was uh, was one of the factors that affected things and confused uh, interpretations. Do you think that the um, the caring for people may have also been a factor in in that um, you said that people were terrified and as a result people were, died probably because they were not cared for where they perhaps may have survived. So the fact that people were terrified and perhaps there was more care in San Francisco area and therefore the death rate was not as bad. Well, I think that's a good question. I think that, uh, you know, number one, there wasn't a lot you could do for anybody anyway, other than keep someone hydrated. Uh, you know, I don't think that that would account for uh, pretty significant discrepancies between cities and, and, and outcomes. Uh, you know, it probably had some minor impact. Uh, you know, you had, you know, an enormous effort by people in healthcare. In fact, for, from the time I got involved in preparedness, until two years ago, I would always, every time I gave a talk, I would raise one question, you know, one that we don't know the answer to is whether the healthcare uh, system, whether workers might have the courage to expose themselves to a lethal infectious disease, but would they want to risk going home and taking that to their families? We obviously know the answer to that question now. Yeah, the healthcare workers have uh, behave with extraordinary courage. Uh, even though in 1918, you knew if you were going into medicine, you were going to face infectious disease. That was part of the game. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there were differences in care. Uh, I'm sure some people died because they weren't hydrated. Uh, but I doubt that it varied that much city to city. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. I had another question, but I will leave it to the end after everybody else, everyone else gets a turn. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for those questions, Tracy. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, Mike, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, John, you talked about Philadelphia. I, I asked you earlier uh, about it as being one of the hot spots. Uh, can you describe what was going on in Philadelphia and what they sort of, what was their biggest mistakes? Yeah, well, Philadelphia was run by a uh, one of the most corrupt political machines in the country, probably worse than Tammany. Uh, I'll tell you how bad it was. In the middle of the pandemic, the uh, mayor was indicted, not for sticking his hand in somebody's pocket, but as an accessory to murder. I mean, they were thugs in the political machine in Philadelphia. Uh, and they were largely run by saloon owners or back strongly and they were reluctant to do anything. Uh, they had a, a Liberty Loan parade scheduled for September 28th. A lot of cities did at that time. Influenza had already gotten to the city and was spreading, and the medical community was urging the public health commissioner to cancel the parade. He was a perfectly nice guy, but he didn't have any backbone. Uh, the parade went forward. And, you know, like clockwork, incubation period influences 24 to 72 hours and boom, influenza exploded. Uh, I mean, that came after the n national draft had actually been canceled on September, two days before the parade, because the army camps were already overrun with influenza and they didn't want anybody else going to the camps. Uh, so it was not as though influenza was not known at that time. There was no ignorance. Uh, so that that would be one example. And that would be, you know, I focused a lot on, on in Philadelphia. Uh, I couldn't write about every city and I could, it would have gotten incredibly redundant. Uh, the book was designed for a popular audience. Um, yeah, but Philadelphia was, was, was and you know, that was a city where 
uh, again, they lied uh, as much as they did in any city in the country. Uh, to the extent, maybe my favorite anecdote about about that is when Philadelphia finally belatedly closed schools, banned public back gatherings, closed churches, uh, you know, saloons, of course, everything. One of the newspapers actually said, this is, I remember it well, this is a direct quote, this is not a public health measure. There is no cause for alarm. I mean, you know, I mean, how stupid did they think people were? Uh, anyway, so that was Philadelphia. All right, thanks, John. Um, next, um, Stanley, would you like to raise your question? Hey, sorry, I was trying to figure out how to enable my mic and my uh, and webcam. So I think my question has to do with the compare and contrast between the influenza pandemic and COVID-19. Tracy already mentioned the factor of social media. I would like to hear your commentary on the difference of air travel between then and now affecting how how let, let's say the pen, how the virus is being spread because people are traveling a lot more now and also how it's lengthening duration of the pandemic well Thanks. yeah I and mean, you're muted by the way i i didn't He's hear you unmuted. Yes, fine. okay i mean obviously you know air travel spread a virus in a matter of hours in 1918 it took a lot longer. But there was a remarkable simultaneity in 1918, especially considering the difference in travel times. Uh, and what that would indicate is a couple of things. I mean, for example, in early September on multiple continents, the second wave erupted within you know a couple of weeks of each other. Uh, so that means, number one, the first wave had to uh, seed itself around the world, which it did. And second, there had to have been convergent evolution because this second wave lethal version of the virus, which was also extremely transmissible. You know, I mean, that was basically the same on, on different continents uh, simultaneously without air travel when it took at least a week to get anywhere. Uh, so that would not, in, in North America, you could sort of track the disease from the Northeast by railroad and, and ship down the coast. And around New Orleans was probably the early Southern uh, city hit, you know, major port, obviously. Uh, and then it, it moved inland uh, and got to the West Coast slower. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, it was in Africa. At the same, almost to the same day, uh, there were cases erupting in Africa and, and in Boston uh, that were, you know, the first versions of the second wave virus. So I don't see how it could have spread without air travel. So the only other explanation is the virus is evolving in the same direction in different places. Thank you, John. Uh, next up, we have Tiffany James. All right, uh, we will move to Wendy. Tiffany, if you're not ready. I have two questions for you, John, and I'll take the most important one first. Um, if you were to write a new book, what do you think would be the biggest scandal of this pandemic? Do you think it could be that we actually managed to convince a majority of the population in almost every country of the world to actually back the herd immunity train, even though that it's apparent to many of us that it's actually an economic driving force here? How did they manage to do that and, um, put, I actually, and put economy you, in front of lives, which is my personal opinion? 
Well, I think the the number one, obviously, I don't think uh, Trump has to be number one. Is uh, you know, no one in public health ever imagined. You know, I know a lot of people in the preparedness community. I can tell you, nobody ever in any of their planning anticipated as one of the scenarios a White House that was actively undermining every recommendation from the public health community. Uh, you know, that clearly is number one. I think in this instance, you know, if this had been 1918 and you had virus as lethal as that, or even if it was no more lethal, but it was hitting people in their 20s instead of people who are, you know, 75, 80 in nursing homes, you would have a very, very different response than what we have had. I think the the fact that it was primarily the elderly, um, also, that it moved in, in, in different geographic regions at different times. I think one of the mistakes was probably closing down the entire country at the same time, uh, including areas where there was no virus and no spread, no community spread. Uh, I think that did not help you politically, and I don't know that it helped you epidemiologically either. Uh, but that combination of uh, or primarily the, the, you know, the, the fact that it was the elderly who were dying, you know, it, it gave, I mean, you do have to balance economic and impacts and collateral damage. Nobody suggested in 2009, you all lived through 2009, which incidentally, like 19, you know, that was almost two entirely different pandemics. The overwhelming majority of people who was less dangerous than ordinary seasonal influenza. But the tiny minority that got sick, severely ill, it was 1918. And the average age of death was in the 30s, a little bit older than 1918, but not by much. Uh, you know, but nobody would have suggested in, in 2009 that you close things down. In 1957, uh, which was a moderate pandemic, not like what we're going through now, certainly not like 1918, uh, the Association of State and Territorial Health Commissioners gathered in Washington. They decided not to not to do anything. Uh, so you have to weigh those things. You know, I think the, the, the killer here was the lack of support and the effort to undermine the steps that were taken. Uh, so it wasn't really a surprise to me that there were these people saying the economy is more important. I think that really came out of the White House primarily. You would have had people shouting it in any instance. But if Trump had done even a reasonably competent job, I think all those things would have been muted. Um, but but if we look at that, because I mean, OK, Trump's a Republican, but I actually live and work in Sweden as a teacher in a school. OK. And Sweden has a socialist uh, government and the socialist government here said nothing. So we were not allowed masks in school. There's no HEPA filters. There's no carbon dioxide meters. There's absolutely nothing whatsoever. We have a we have a death rate that is six to ten times higher than our Nordic neighbors in triple Norway. Denmark, six times Norway's, eight times Finland's. Yes. Your yeah. economy so did we've done the opposite. no economic benefit from that either. No. Zero. So a socialist government is not locking down at all, but not accepting any responsibility for the consequences of their actions. Well, I mean, it's a democratic country country, so it's up to the voters. Uh, you know, they made, as you know better than I, a conscious decision to, you know, they thought they were doing the right thing, playing the long game, figuring you can't keep the virus in a box forever. And whenever you, you, you relax the restrictions, you're going to have the same impacts 
anyway, so you may as well not have it. You know, they, there was a logic to it. I didn't agree with the logic. The results prove, in my view, uh, and I think in yours, that they made the wrong decision. But, you know, again, there was a logic to it. They thought it was the best thing to do and that over the course of the pandemic that they would be proven right, even if in the immediate aftermath of the decision, they looked pretty bad. In fact, two years later, they still look pretty bad. Uh, you know, I don't know what was in their heads, only what they articulated publicly. Uh, again, you know more about it than I do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Tiffany James um, is able to speak. We just have to give her a moment to um, unmute. So uh, thank you, Wendy, for your question. Thank you um, for your patience. I'm sorry. I have my question in the chat, and I just want to go to it and read it really quick. Um, let's see. Katie, do you see my question? It's buried now, I think. Yeah, I can read it. Um, okay, thank you. Your, of course. In your book, you talked about the U.S. waging total war where there were sacrifices the public was forced to make, like Meatless Monday, uh, Wheaties Meals, Gasless Sunday, etc. cetera. Uh, why do you think the government had the public make sacrifices in the wartime, but not sacrifices uh, during the virus time? Well, the, I mean, it was a wartime. You know, they they were just, you know, Wilson was an obsessive, compulsive personality. Everything in his psyche was geared toward winning the war. And he wanted, you know, as one of his aides said, he wanted to turn the country into one white hot mass of patriotism. So all those sacrifices that you asked about or cited you know, were made to further the war effort. And, you know, Wilson viewed the influenza pandemic as interfering with the war effort. So he tried to basically steamroll right over it. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, Chloe, uh, you had a comment or a question. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say Please. thank you. I'm sorry, it took me a while to get back to a mute, but thank you. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, in the 2009 pandemic, I knew people who pulled their kids out of school and you know people had like if you had insurance you can get immediate access to antivirals so that was like a little bit of a difference but i, I don't see that that's been the case you know in the 1918 it seemed more um indiscriminate maybe than than in 2009 or even now well i'm not sure exactly what you're asking well, maybe I'm wrong about that, like that, that the wealthy have largely been able to avoid the worst of the current pandemic. And I knew that to be the case in 2009. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, socioeconomic factors are certainly, um, in, you know, uh, important in terms of mortality, morbidity. Uh, not so much in the sense of care because there was so little that could be done in 1918. Uh, so it was in less terms of, in terms of uh, spread. You know, there was a pretty careful study and came up with a con exactly the conclusions that you would expect that, you know, the amount of square footage per person in a dwelling affected how much spread there was in that dwelling. So that's obviously related to wealth, uh, you know, but again, other than hydration, you know, aspirin, uh, there, there just was so little that treatment uh, that could be done. 
there actually were, you know, for the people who ha had bacterial pneumonia, and I think probably a majority of the deaths were bacterial pneumonia. Uh, it's hard to say how much. Jeff Taubenberger is a very good scientist who's spent the last 25 or 30 years looking at 1918, including reconstituting the virus, digging it up and so forth. Uh, I mean, he thinks that 95% of the deaths were bacterial. I disagree. I think there's, you know, too many either. I don't know of any actual data that distinguishes between how many people died in less than four days and how many in more than four days. You know, but there were clearly an enormous number of people died pretty rapidly. And those were not bacterial pneumonias. Even today, bacterial pneumonia following influenza is about an 8% case mortality rate. And if it's, uh, you know, uh, antibiotic resistant, then you're talking about 30%, which is the same as 1918. But, you know, again, there was, there was so little that, and, and I started to say, they actually developed vaccines against uh, bacterial pneumonias that they did not get widely distributed. They did have oxygen, but that was even less widely distributed. Uh, if you were lucky enough to have a secondary bacterial infection caused by a vaccine that happened to have been developed against that particular uh, pathogen, then the vaccines actually might have had some impact. Uh, but obviously, they're not going to work against uh, the virus itself. Uh, and those, were, those, I think, were, you know, outside the military, there were very few places that develop those vaccines. I don't know how widely distributed they were, but laboratories in different cities uh, where there was good scientific infrastructure, which is not too many places in 1918, uh, they would develop their own vaccines. All right. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, Chloe, for that uh, last question from the audience. We're going to turn back to Yanir. It is uh, about 6 p.m. Eastern time, we're on the hour here. So uh, one more comment or question from Yanir and we will wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Yanir. Great. John, so thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting. And I have a, a challenging question. For those of you who don't know, John was a football coach uh, before he wrote his uh, best-selling books. And, and really, I, I want to ask you this question uh, because it's super important. The, the challenge of NPIs that you talked about and the challenge of being honest is a challenge of, of teamwork, a challenge of galvanizing people in the face of um, uh, an external threat, which in sports, people do a lot, right? They, they, they rise to the occasion, they bring a can-do attitude, they uh, respond to, um, and they, they put in huge amounts of effort in football, as you know, in order to win a game. And let's talk about the challenge of responding to the pandemic. How do we, as coach, as a, how would you as a coach advise leaders or advise um, thought leaders uh, to uh, inspire that kind of shared effort that would make uh, the difference in confronting this pandemic? Well, you know, just pre preach unity and tell the truth. The only time in Trump's presidency where his popularity or approval, I guess, uh, cracked 50% was right after he said we we're at war with the virus. People wanted to come together. You know, had he done a good job with the pandemic, he, I think he probably would have been reelected. Uh, so hopefully that's a lesson to other politicians in the future that doing the right thing is good is in your own self-interest uh but people do want to come together but it requires leadership to bring them together uh, and you know part of that leadership 
is telling the truth. You know, you know Churchill's famous blood, sweat, and tears. I, you know, I remember participating in multiple pandemic games, essentially war games, and I would always preach that, and I would expect a lot of opposition in whatever team I was. But I was always, you know, it was like pushing against an open door. People tended to agree with me. And we would go out, and our first move would be a blood, sweat, and tears speech. Uh, you know, had, you know, that, and, you know, you get into more specifics, framing it that creating an infrastructure where people expectations are, are set in a realistic way, you know, so that you start out saying, look, we don't know everything. We're going to make mistakes. As new more information comes in, we're going to change our recommendations. If people had that expectation, if they were told that at the beginning, then I think things would have been better. Uh, you know, I can remember one of those pandemic games was uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I don't remember the exact people involved. It was in California. Um, and I gave a, you know, a talk before the game started. And as usual, I talk about the importance of telling the truth. And the first move came and the health commissioner, I forgot what county, got up and, and said, you know, oh, there's an index case. Uh, you know, so he got up and his first public statement was, well, this may not be the pandemic influenza. This may be something else. Well, you know, technically that was the truth. But he's already behind the curve and he's already lost the messaging game to at that point. Facebook hardly existed. It was a while ago, but it, you you know, you, you've gotten my point. What his message should have been, we don't know if this is the case, but it really doesn't matter because it's coming here anyway. And we, we, we will we'll know whether this is an index case or not after we run, you know, X, Y, Z tests. We'll have those results in 10, 12, 14 hours. And the second we get the results, we're going to tell you. In the meantime, it doesn't matter because it's coming. And I had just given the talk and everybody had applauded wildly and agreed, including this gentleman. Thank you very, very much. And I, I think we are really devoted to this uh, frame that you have advocated for years. Um, we very much appreciate your articulating it so well. Uh, and and we hope and we don't think it's too late to change course given the opportunities that technology and science that we have today allow us in particular the most important thing is that we can share the constructive experiences that have been successful in one place the challenge that we face continues to be that people will adapt and learn from the experience that has worked, that you have tried to teach everyone for many years. Thank you very much, John, for what you've been doing, and thank you for joining us today. Sure, yeah, you're welcome. Enjoyed it. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Never quite had that talk. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much.